This is an island, Bainbridge Island. When I moved here, there were about 8,000 people, and there are now 28,000 people. <laughs> And so uh, when I moved here, it was mostly dropouts like me. I was moving directly from the west side of Philadelphia to Bainbridge Island. We moved here in 74. By 76, uh, we thought, wouldn't it be wonderful to live here? So I bought this place in 76. It was a cabin that was sitting down about six feet off the ground here. And I bought a bunch of house jacks, or rented house jacks and cribbing, and I jacked the cabin up eight feet in the air. This is, this is a younger version of me with the jacked up. That's the old cabin. That's amazing. You just lifted it. Yeah, we jacked it. I dragged those beams under it and got rented house jacks, and we jacked it and moved up there. So, so it was we, a cabin? Like, what kind of... It was a summer cabin. It was a little 20 by 20 box. What I did was I built a house under it while we were living upstairs. And so we started raising a family here, and, and we've lived here now 44 years. So you didn't want to completely tear down the cabin? Uh, well, I didn't have any money. And I set a budget of building the house for 9000 the, the original glass, I milled all the windows myself out of mm -hmm. lumber that I went to the lumber yard yeah. and just picked the good sticks. The original glass, I bought the candy counters out of an old candy store that was uh, being torn down, and I cut them into size for this. That's why. The mullions are two foot, ten and three quarters, because that was the size of the counters. The point is that we did it. I built it stick by stick. You didn't just design it, you built it. Oh, no, no, I built it. I, you know, I built this just like Hannah and I built that. I, you know, I, I, I get great pleasure out of physically building things. So the reason we did the cabin I have worked and lived on this property for 44 years. Because I don't do design work at my office because I'm interrupted too often, I would always do all the design work on all our projects, including Gates House. Yeah. Here in this little, little back room in the cabin, it's almost like a basement. I just got to the point where I thought, you know, I've been living on the water for 40 years and why shouldn't I be looking at the water? when I'm working. And Hannah had wanted a place, she wanted to build a cabin for sleepovers. She was 10 at the time. And there had been a little brick terrace and outbuilding in here. It took us about eight months of, you know, just Hannah and I working on it. I wouldn't let her up on the roof, but all the walls, we, we cut out everything in the garage. We pre-assembled the whole building in the garage, and then we'd carry it out from the garage the building's sort of built backwards, you know, where all the framing is exposed and I put the insulation outside the framing because I thought it would look cool. <laughs> and frankly, I thought, you know, if I'm building this with a 10-year-old, I better pick a vocabulary of construction that could accept a great deal of inaccuracy. And so we decided to build it in rough sawn material so that if we had a joint that was a little bit off, it would feel totally acceptable. The footprint is just not much. It's eight by ten. Eight by ten. On the outside. And eight, why eight by ten? It's what fit. <laughs> no, what what it is is there's enough room for the wood stove and clearance. I got a six foot six bed. I've got uh, two foot eight between the desk and this. But uh, you can see the beds fold out of the walls. You know, there there is the upper bunk and then there's lower bunk. Both of them fold up. The desk folds down. You can see the hinge. And so when everything's folded down, it's just big enough for a six-person poker table because I play poker with my... I have the same guys I've been playing poker with for 42 years. You know, it's got all these fold out... All the beds fold out of the walls so that she could have someone sleep over. And this is called a traction strut. This thing weighs about 100 and some pounds, but the traction strut... It's like the reverse of one of those lifts on a tailgate or something yeah, like that. Yeah. It slows down the weight okay. uh, to let this down. And this gets let down. These little thingies here get pulled out like that. Okay. I made these guys. So this side lays on them. And then this is the weird one. Do you see this turnbuckle here? This bar, see those two steel plates mm -hmm. up there? I drop that in there with the turnbuckle on it. 
and then that supports this corner. It's funny how I get up here. Oh, there we go. And I just gently put this thing down. Sometimes it catches on that last screw. There we go. See now the traction strut is engaged. And see this weighs quite a bit. That was all your design? Well, yeah. This, you can see this corner is unsupported. Was this from boating or was it from... I uh, worked as an auto mechanic. You know, I grew up in an Appalachian coal town. And, you know, you're either on the football team or you work on cars. <laughs> that was about it. <laughs> There's a little strut right here. Heavy duty hardware. Uh, well, I didn't want the kids falling out of bed. But there, see, it's down, and this will support uh, at least two, three hundred pounds of people. Size, yeah. But underneath here, uh, I have a ladder. Yeah. And now you see the second window revealed. Yeah, that's it. Is she wanted the little secret windows where you could look out? And then I did them so that they they appeared to be just kind of holes knocked out of the siding. The, the window's actually a lot wider, and she wanted a secret compartment so she could put things back in here. So, you know, secret compartment for a kid. That's, by the way, those are all the projects that we're wor I'm working on right now. Yeah. So oh, okay. when someone calls, I can pull out the plans. And, you know, I sit here. I got, got a nice view. I sit yeah. here, yeah. you know, 12 hours a day. Then finally, this part here, you can see the grill under it. Uh -huh. This lifts up. This rolls out and built into the wall here are four kilowatts of uh, batteries because on this island the power used to be out at least 10 days a year. It's really good to have this place you can back up onto. The wood stove heats it really well. It's got enough energy so that everybody can run their internet stuff and charge batteries. And there's a little fridge. There's a little refrigerator wood storage, so it's sort of our lifeboat when the power goes out. We just move in here. And the most interesting part about this project was that it was meant to be this fun thing for him. And what happened is that this thing turned into our family room because it's warmer than the rest of the house. What'll happen is I work here every night of the week. I normally work till about 11 every night. That's when I do my design work. And then, but usually around nine o'clock, Hannah or Beth will wander in. I'll sit there and draw and they'll watch a movie. And you know, th this little stove will heat the place up. You know, even if it's like 30, 40 degrees out, it'll get the place toasty in about 15 minutes. The other thing that I found really remarkable and I'm now starting to do on houses is that from here to the house is no big deal. You know, I'm working out here or any of us are in here. I mean, it could be storming out and you know, you, you have to use the bathroom or you want something from the big refrigerator in the, in the kitchen. And it is just simply no big deal to go walk out. You know, you can't get too wet or too cold in 35 feet, right? So what I've discovered is that having houses in pieces where you move between one and the other is not a problem. It's simply not. And actually this house down in Oregon, there's the door open. You can see it, it's still outside. Mm -hmm. And there's the ocean beyond. Oh, wow. The owners are the first couple that I convinced would be a good idea. And it's really windy and it's a courtyard house. But you, you know, between the different guest rooms and the main parent's place, you know, there's about a 25, 30 foot walk and you're out in the wind and rain, it's covered. And um, it's, it's no big deal. If you live in a place that has an ecosystem, that has life to it, that is connected to the planet, what, I'll tell you, what normally happens is, oh, I want a bag of potato chips or something from the fridge, and I get right about to here, and like last night, there was the most spectacular half moon, and it was setting right over the Olympics, right out there. And so you're walking out, and you go, oh, and I... The, doesn't almost doesn't matter what kind of weather it is. I always sort of stop here and look at it. And you know the the other funny thing about it is is personal surprise is that um, at the time I was doing we were doing this I was designing a uh, 500,000 square foot office building for the federal government 
in Portland, Oregon. And this one's 80 square feet, that one's 500,000. I got just as much pleasure, if not more pleasure, out of doing this than I did that. And that's, that building, that high-rise we did, won the award as the best high-rise in the Western Hemisphere and the most energy-efficient high-rise in the Western Hemisphere. And that made me realize, as I get older, that I've got to keep making stuff. And it doesn't matter whether it's a, you know, a, what was a $131 million high-rise or a $20,000 cabin. It's, it doesn't matter. As long as I'm making something, I'm happy. This is just funny. When I was young and really crazy, that, yeah. see that frame? Yeah. That's an elevator. When I was really crazy, I built an elevator. Well, we're 75 feet above the beach, so that takes us down to our dock. Does it work? Oh, yeah, so sure. No. Oh, yeah. You yeah. sit in that. Well, yeah, no, it, we've been using it. All my kids grew up with it. Uh, I keep it very well maintained, and uh, it's a big winch, it's a motorized winch. Okay. And then this, you see this uh, big, heavy rubber cable? Yeah. The traveling cable goes down with it. You want to go in it? Sure. Do you want to? There you go. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's... You know, in, Sit down here. Yeah. When I turn the key, there's going to be about a five-second delay. I put that in there for mistakes. Okay. Just stay away from things. Oh. It uh, takes a minute and 23 seconds to the beach and down and a minute and 23 up. Wow. Okay, so I'm going to take That's you back. Yep. I'll stop That's and amazing. take you back up. Okay? <laughs> yep, go for it. <laughs> Actually... <laughs> I should cut this blackberry, but this is where we get all our blackberry. We only cut them when they get into the cable. Anyhow, so yeah, this is this is a little homemade affair. You know, what happened was there was a guy who lived up the beach. His name was Brinton Sprague, old guy, and he had designed all the elevators for Grand Coulee Dam. And between his son and Brinton and I, we built this thing for $5,000. Oh, I got dirt on the floor here. Uh, the only thing that we had help with uh, was this piece of glass, because it weighs 400 pounds. That point up there had to be lined up on that point down there. So when we framed it and got it all framed, it was off by about a quarter of an inch. So I got a, uh, you know what a come along is? I unscrewed the, everything, by the way, there's no nails in this building. It's totally screwed together. I unscrewed the plywood, which is what gives it rigidity, and I hooked the come along down there and then put a bolt through there and I ratcheted it back to perfectly square and then I re-screwed the plywood on it. It's within an eighth now. And then I wanted it light, so I made, th this is called a spaced column. There's two two by fours, but I've tied them together with these steel pieces. So it keeps them light, but it also, you know, they're not going to buckle because they act together. So um, I wanted to have a lot of view. So I held the beam back two feet away from where the glass would be. And then I cantilevered everything out. And you can see I used two by fours, which are pretty, pretty small pieces of wood but I did a lot of them. They're on eight inch centers. And then I wanted to be sure that I didn't insult the beam. Okay, what I mean insult the beam is that, what, what's carrying this whole thing? The beam, right? If I had put a lot of mullions and a lot of vertical pieces in the glass, there'd be confusion on what's holding the roof up. So for the beam to be honored and to say that I'm here, I'm Atlas holding up the world, I couldn't have anything outboard of it. It allows the beam to tell the story that it's doing the work. Everything in this world has a nature. And if they have a nature, then I have chosen to work with that nature. So instead of thinking of architecture as a style or as virtual, As you go on in life, you start to see the really beautiful things are the things that are tangible, that you can touch, that's real. So when all these, you know, the new isms that come at us that all stem from virtual reality and virtual this and virtual that is a way to divorce ourselves from this living planet.
I've been lecturing on this for years. And the fact of the matter is, it's successful. I've become a well-known architect. I've done well, and however your your bent is in life, success can lie in responding to the real world. Because everything in this world is different, every topography, every combination of flora, fauna, topography, and pro human program, they're all different. Because of that, there's an infinite variety of design that can be created, not by an ism or not by a style, but can be created by revealing and reflecting the unique circumstances of every condition on the, this planet. I've been thinking about writing something as I get a lot older, I'm 70, yeah. you know, about staying put. You know, Americans move around a lot. You know, they move an average of 11 to 15 times. And I've been here for 44 years. You know, I know every tree. Mm. I know every plant. Let's see this little fur here, this little guy. This little fur appeared in the gravel and it was about that tall. and. And, you know, I've watched it. It put on two feet this year. Well, it's, it's funny, last year it didn't, it, you know, we had three years of drought. Last year it didn't put on an inch. It actually, part of the top died away. And now it's got two tops. So I think the taller one will win out. But it's, it's that kind of stuff where you know every plant, every tree. And, and this was really sad. There was a madrona here, and we wanted, I wanted a yard, and there was a branch that came off this way. And I cut off this one to make the yard. That was the first thing I did. But it still flourished because there was a septic system in here. And then about uh, 10 years ago, the septic system failed and I had to move it up to the back acre. And as soon as we cut out the septic system, the tree started dying because it was living off the septic system. And, and then finally, this winter, it died completely. And then we thought, well, it's got this big hole, we'll plant a new madrona at the base. So we planted that and then realized the, gr the ground was so dry that we needed to get water to it. So then I came up with this idea of doing a funnel. And it works. See, it waters the tree, you see it's got new growth on it. And I, I just thought it'd be sort of poetic because the old tree is funneling water to the new life. <laughs> 